Um, hello and welcome. Um, I've been very privileged in uh, my role at Monotype of getting to spend quite a lot of time with the archives that the company holds uh, in our UK office in Salfords, which is on the site where the British Monotype printing plant had been. Um, the archive at Salfords is pretty comprehensive and amazingly detailed uh, from the years predating about 1985 when things begin getting particularly patchy. But the more time that I've spent w looking through those archives, uh, trying to uncover various details and wrap my head around the history of what went on at Monotype in the UK, I become more conscious of where all the holes are in this documentation. And actually, there's amazingly little information from the very first years compared to how thoroughly everything was documented. Um, it seems like in the very first 10 years or so of the company, they were, when they were really a startup trying to begin a business uh, in the United Kingdom that had branched off for an American company, they were just moving too fast to really make a lot of notation about what they were working out. And it raises a lot of interesting questions that I've been able to piece together to some degree from what we know about how they worked in the years afterward. Um, the thing to bear in mind about the very earliest days at Monotype, um, both in the States and in the UK, was that they were about a composition solution. Um, their goal was to introduce these machines that made it easier to compose text and print at a greater scale, a greater volume. Um, and the approach to doing that was to adapt what were popular typefaces in the trade already and to convince people to invest in these new machine systems by showing that they were up to the challenge of matching the quality of typography that had been possible with handset composition. Um, so the typographic programs that we associate with monotype and there were parallels to this at Linotype as well, really came later on when the companies had the confidence and the market position to really introduce entirely new designs into the market. But the earliest days were all about perfecting the quality of designs that already existed in a new composition medium. Um, so I think this trade is, this quote is very telling about what they were trying to do looking back from a, a point of reflection some decades after the company had begun. But there is this question about what were these bread and butter typefaces that Monotype was trying to bring out into the world and where do they come from? Well, luckily we have some pretty good documentation at least what those sources were. Um, this is the first page of a handwritten logbook that lists all of the series that were produced in Salfords in the, at the type drawing office and made into type. And there's actually a really wonderful efficiency to the notation about all this information. We know the series number, what the style was called. The red are notes about where those typefaces were adapted from, and occasionally when they were taken out of circulation, when they didn't um, s perform according to expectations. But we see here uh, M&R, which is Miller and Richard, the Scottish foundry, and SB is Stevenson Blake. Um, and we see these two foundries supplying most of the types that Monotype adapted for its earliest um, for its earliest releases. And this was very specific to the UK. There was almost no sharing of designs between American and British monotype in the earliest years. They began trading designs after a while, but they would actually just adapt from one another, not share uh, the designs in the exact same form. Um, so to take a, let's take a close look at what was actually being produced, and I'm just going through really the first couple of years, because they expanded so rapidly, it's hard to be comprehensive in a short amount of time. But the very first series cut was a modern design based on a very successful uh, style of typefaces released by Miller and Richard, um, probably derived from uh, punches originally cut by Richard Austin, um, but very prevalent in the newspaper and book trade at the time. So there was a clear interest in going after uh, the marketplace and the demands that were there for certain kinds of typography. So there's a note in uh, a notebook in Salfords that modern was actually derived from two different Miller and Richards typefaces. Um, these are the two, the two faces that are referred to, and looking at the end results, 
uh, of modern number one. I think they essentially gone, went with the proportions of Miller and Richards number 28, but the sort of density and stroke contrast of number 23. But you can see how they can compare here from the setting of Miller and Richard with monotypes modern. Um, when we start moving into the subsequent typefaces, uh, there's a really, really great um, bit of uh, reference material that we find in the proofs. So these that I'm showing in the first pages are the hot metal trials that were set at Salfords. This was their testing out all of the characters that they had cut to be composed on the monotype machines. So here's a, uh, a large setting of uh, the Stevenson Blake face, just to give you an idea of what the personality was like in some better detail. But these are two paragraphs of text that come off the same trial sheet in Salfords. Starting from series two, we see that they actually printed uh, on top of one another, uh, or above and below, the text that was designed, produced, composed that monotype, and the original foundry type setting below. When monotype adapted typefaces, they would strike a deal with the foundry who produced the original and accept a set of standing type of the design that was to be uh, reproduced. So they were working off of not punches, not drawings, but actual type. So here they have composed some text with the original to compare right in their early internal trials um, how well they had captured the spirit of it. Um, what we see looking through these adaptations in the earliest years um, is that Although the overall personality of the shapes of the letters and the text color had been matched, the spacing is actually quite radically different. The monotype faces don't have nearly the same overall density of color as the foundry type that they were based on. Um, and we see it again and again, some faces fare better than others. Where the modern had captured the overall color pretty well, um, some of these other faces did not. And where they've uh, gone with small text sizes of this sans serif for Miller and Richard, um, you see they've gone with just caps, so they're actually being very specific about what kind of typeface they've adapted for what. So they're really thinking about this for small notation headlines. They didn't even do very large sizes of this. But again, they haven't quite matched the density of the foundry type. Um, at this point, it doesn't look like they were rearranging the spacing of, uh, or the, the spacing allotted for each of the characters based on the typeface design. They had worked out in their planning of the unit system for the monotype casters, an A always needed this much space, a B always needed this much space, and so forth. So there are some slight variations in the pattern um, with the versions that were adapted for the machine setting. Um, Albion fared a little bit better, but it's a little bit tricky to tell from this sample because they use gigantic word spaces for the, uh, the text that was set. Um, but to make the point in looking at just those five early typefaces, that was the first couple of years. This is a chart from the very first issue of the Monotype Recorder. Or I take that back, I think this may have been a little bit further along. This is 1904, where they had already produced about 23 type families after releasing their very first in 1900. So this is a very, very rapid development of type families to get them out to market. Um, so they were working to a lot of standardized methods to produce at this rate. Um, and I think that accounts for some of the discrepancies in spacing and colors. They were working so much to the standards, there wasn't as much time to analyze each family piece by piece to try to replicate uh, the effect. Um, this view of the timeline gives a sense of exactly how much was happening and so rapidly in those early years. Um, that period between uh, Lanston Monotype in the US being founded um, and the patents being uh, being allowed to uh, run the machines in Britain was mostly about technical development. Lanston in the US had released a couple of typefaces before the, the founding of Monotype in the UK, but it was mostly the period of the machine development which hit its stride around the time that UK Monotype was founded. But from 1899, when they built the plant in Surrey, um, they were just cranking out typefaces one after another. Um, 
And I have a pet theory that the lack of documentation just has a lot to do with this speed. They were doing things in a pretty systematic way. It was all the same because um, they were meeting these rapid deadlines. And it was a few years further on, at about 1906, where they had been in operation in the UK for almost a decade and re releasing typefaces for a few years that they began putting dates and notations on everything. They hit this point where they were realizing it was time to keep track of how much they were doing uh, when they were so prolific. Um, and it was actually, they carried on like this for years. It wasn't until 1913 that the very first original design came out of the drawing office at Salford's, and that was already series 100. So, they had gotten their methodology down for what they were doing, and they just plowed ahead getting them out, perfecting uh, the quality of the typography and the machine setting all along. Um, but what exactly was the process that they were going through throughout this period of doing everything? Um, as I said, when they were adapting typefaces from existing foundries, they would start from standing type. They would blow it up on an overhead projector like this, um, to the scale of the production drawings that would be made inside the drawing office and first do a tracing off of this pro projection, trying to capture every little nook and cranny, every detail, any, every idiosyncrasy of the exact size cut that was being adapted. Um, from there, the ladies of the drawing office, and they were mostly ladies in the drawing office, uh, you can see the stern-faced supervisors in the back staring at what the ladies were doing. Um, they would refine the drawings um, made off of those projections. And this is where they were working out the spacing and adjusting the proportions of individual letters to fit the uh, units allocated uh, for each letter within the composition method, producing drawings like this. This is what are referred to as the 10-inch drawings um, because the sort of the live area reflecting what the size of the face of each sort would be is at about 10 inches. Um, and these drawings show a number of things that don't come from the standing type. They really come from the activity that was happening in the drawing office as these families were developed. Um, you see indications of the spacing, the position on the body, uh, accent marks and other additions to characters that would be added over time, built on the dimensions worked out for the individual letter. So this is in a way sort of the if we, if we look at it through the lens of how we talk about things, this is a lot of the metadata around the shape of those letters of what you see in print. These are the structures and the patterns um, that were worked out by the draftsmen and the typographers in the drawing office in order to get them uh, finished to a level of precision that was required for the production at the great scale um, needed for the machines. Now, I was talking about the unit system and the need to adapt uh, the proportions and spacing of the letters. Um, and if you're not familiar with, with that, this is essentially what it means. Um, the monotype was a mechanical calculator of space, essentially. It, was, it would rack up the space of all the letters keyed in text and then uh, allow the operator to figure out the size of the word spaces to fit a measure. Um, what that meant was a given M space in any alphabet was divided into 18 units, and the letters could be any number of units within 18. But it essentially led to there were patterns, and these come from the row within a square grid of letters that went into the machine. Everything in one row was going to be five units wide. Every letter on the next row was going to be six units, seven units in the next row, and on and on. To do that, that foundry type had to be slightly stretched or squeezed um, through some combination of adjusting the side bearings and adjusting the shapes of the letters themselves. That was the start of establishing what the overall personality of the monotype versions of these faces was all about. And considering the methodology they were working with, being fairly systematic about this, this would lead to the overall personality of text set with a monotype system as, a, as opposed to those foundry sources. Now, all of this came from somewhere. They didn't figure this out in 1899 um, and suddenly get into rapid production. The methods of preparing types for line casters had been fairly well established, not just at uh, Lanston in the US, but 
This was happening at Linotype. It was happening at uh, Rogers Typograph, which is another line casting uh, company that was established in the United States. And when the plant at Salfords was set up, they were recruited Frank Hinman Pierpont, who had worked at Typograph in Germany, the German office of this American company, which would be out of business before long. But Frank Hinman Pierpont was an engineer who had been managing type production for typograph for line casters, using a process of working with pantographs to capture designs of letters from mechanical drawings for manufacture. So the challenge was really adjusting that process for the specific needs of the monotype system. But Pierpont brought with him Fritz Max Stelzer, who ran the drawing office at Typograph in Germany with him. And he put the charge to Stelzer to set up a drawing office to prepare all of this artwork for the typefaces in the UK. Now, Stelzer is a towering figure in the history of British monotype. Uh, he is famously autocratic, famously involved and in demanding in just about every phase of the manufacture of the machines, um, and seems to be the person who had the vision about the overall typographic program. Um, Stelzer, however, we know next to nothing about. We see fragments of his handwriting on proofs. Um, we see detailed logs that he kept once they began um, noting what was happening day to day in the drawing office. But there's no pictures of him that I've been able to find anywhere in the archive, very little biographical information except from local census material from Surrey. Um, we know that he retired in 1940, but I haven't tracked down any information about when he died. There is some thoughts that he may have been um, forced into retirement at the outbreak of World War II because of his German background, but very little to prove it. So it's another one of these glaring holes in what was otherwise a very well-documented and much publicized history of what happened at Monotype. But with all that publicity, it was Pierpont who got all the accolades. He was the man in charge, and he was the man with the vision. But knowing the division of labor of what went on at the company, Stelzer appears to be the man who made those typefaces happen. Um, and it was Robin Nicholas, uh, who was my supervisor when I started at Monotype, who really put me on the scent of the Stelzer mystery. Um, and he and I have tried, along with other people, to dig up more information without much results. But when we think about how much was going on and how rapidly in the early years, Stelzer was training all of the draft people in the drawing office. He was recruiting them from the local Gr Rygate Grammar School, teaching these young men and women uh, a trade and exactly what was required. Pierpont was very interested in the accuracy of the reproduction and the manufacture of the typefaces, but Stelzer there in the drawing office would have been leading the team of people who were making the decisions about what should those letters look like, how would they need to be modified, what would the spacing be, um, as well as setting up the working methods that would actually carry them through a similar process for decades to come. This is a photograph from the 1950s showing a, a woman working on a 10-inch drawing that matches down to just about every detail and every piece of notation the drawings that were produced in 1900. And we have drawings like this that go right up until the 80s when the only switch really went to making smaller drawings on pieces of tissue paper but still recording much of the same information. So the impact of what went on in those early years, all the questions that we don't know exactly who made the decisions before 1906, um, who decided exactly which typefaces were going to have the most market potential, um, are mostly lost. And it's some combination of Pierpont's vision, Pierpont's demands for quality, and uh, presumably Stelzer working out a lot of the nuts and bolts decision making about how to make these typefaces come into being for monotype. Um, and the library grew and grew and grew. Um, it was pretty vast already before Stanley Morrison began his ambitious program in the 20s of releasing new typefaces and new designs. Um, 
And that program in the 20s has quite a lot to do with the prevalence of the monotype system in the UK. They were deeply embedded in a lot of companies and a lot of publishers already. So they had the ability to begin releasing new typefaces um, without relying on traditions of printing that they were following in the wake of. And there's more to this, obviously, and we do, what we can figure out does come from how thoroughly everything is noted and documented in the year since. But I think these essential questions about what happened in the early days are really, really critical, and we lack a true understanding of the history of the company without that, because it's hard to know what came first. Pierpont didn't sign off on a lot of the drawings, but there's a lot of stories saying that he was the one who said okay to things. Stelzer signed off on a lot of the proofs, but we don't have any um, information in the public-facing stories about his role or involvement. He was never interviewed for the monotype recorder about the role that he played. All that we know is that he seemed to have ran the show um, at least at he was the one in the trenches for about the first 40 years, training everyone. And uh, Stelzer would have trained the people in the drawing office who trained Robin Nicholas, who trained the designers who are working in the company today. There is a pretty direct chain of the decisions made in those earliest years of the company to what happened with the type production right up until the end of the hot metal era that was already influencing what the photocomposition fonts looked like and the digitizations made from them. So, like some of the other things that we've seen here today, this raises just a lot of questions that I am, have been on the trail of and other people are, um, and it's kind of my plea to everyone who sees this, if you ever see anything about Stelzer buried in any little publication, any document, Please, give me a shout. I would love to put more of these pieces together and uh, fill in some of these gaps about exactly what happened with this ambitious startup at the turn of the 20th century uh, that set the stage for what became a pretty powerful operation in the years since. Thank you.